yes uh we are on live great uh very good morning good evening good afternoon as per your respective location uh at the globe i'm dr ashish on behalf of my department and the institute i welcome you all in this much awaited distinguished lecture on physics of life dear friends dolphin pg institute of biomedical and natural sciences dehradun believes that education should be holistic quality focus development of the scientific temperament is our fundamental duty and we are committed to the cause of making learning simulative experimental and exploratory process in order to accelerate science education and to cater the requirement for those researchers and learners in the vicinity that don't have an access of the basic facility for executing science experiments we have started vigyan setu forum under the aegis of divns best practices in this very platform we always bring the intellectual across the globe and today in this series we have been joined by professor raghuveer parthasarthi i am very much delighted to introduce today's speaker professor raghuveer parthasarthi is an american biophysicist and alex king case professor of physics on the faculty of the university of oregon parthasarthi's research explores biophysics the way in which physical laws and properties guide the function of living things his lab focuses especially on the assembly of animal associated microbial communities which they explore using sophisticated optical microscopy and image analysis methods his teaching interest mostly involves courses for non science majors that is the physics of life the physics of energy and the environment so without any further ado i would like to invite uh, professor raghuveer parthasarthi to deliver his talk on physics of life and dear participants uh, if you have any query definitely we will have a 5 to 10 minutes for qa session you can put your queries on our chat box now i would like to invite professor raghuveer parthasarthi for his talk on physics of life please sir mic is over to you wonderful thank you very much and uh thank you for the invitation i'm i'm very happy to virtually be here uh hopefully someday i'll, I'll perhaps visit in person um i wanted to point out also at the start that uh i as mentioned there's time at the end for questions but i'm very open to uh any questions or even spending quite a lot of time with things uh, people may want to ask about or chat about um and that includes uh questions and conversations from our host so in fact i might uh intentionally try to stop a bit early and and invite just a discussion or even just as just a a conversation which i think might be quite quite enjoyable um so before i start off and share the slides uh, i thought i'd just introduce myself yes i'm raghavir parthasarathy uh, as you might guess from the name i am you know, uh, indian by origin i was born in mysore uh, most of my family is from tamil nadu Um, I have lots of relatives in Chennai, Chennai, and visit every few years. So, um, yeah, but, but I'm here uh, in the U.S. at the University of Oregon. I was about one year old when my parents moved to the U.S. Uh, my Tamil is really quite bad, um, so <laughs> I will, of course, be. Uh, yeah, don't ask me about that. Okay, so without further ado, let me launch in, and I will share the setting. Share the screen. Good. Okay, so now if I switch to this, um, good. Hopefully you can see uh, an orange and black screen with things swirling around. Those are bacteria, but I'll tell you more about that in just a moment. So what I thought I would do is first um, point out some general thoughts and motivations about biophysics and the physics of life and this intersection between uh, biology and physics. Uh, but then to be more concrete, give you some examples from my lab's work that focuses specifically on the biophysics of the gut microbiome, uh, which is a fascinating topic and not one that's usually thought of in the context of biophysics. And then I'll come back to some more general thoughts and themes, but as mentioned, um, I very much encourage uh, questions about that. So um, biophysics, I know it's a it's a rather broad uh, audience here, so some of you may have thought a lot about bi biophysics. Some of you have, may have never thought about it. Um, but in any case, biophysics, you know, we can think about what it is as looking at intersections between biology and physics. 
And that includes things like the material properties of biological materials. Uh, it includes things like how physical laws affect how organisms you know, behave and grow and so on. Um, it's all of these possible intersections. And when you start thinking about those intersections, you start to realize that pretty much everything in biology has some very intrinsic physical component that, uh, that physics can, can help us think about. So just to give a couple of examples, if we think about possibly the most uh, iconic molecule in biology, uh, DNA, you know, everybody, even people on the street will, will be able to identify a drawing like this as being DNA, this thing that stores our genetic information. If we think about DNA, DNA already presents us with a very interesting physical puzzle, which is that in every single one of your cells, so each individual cell, you have one meter of DNA. And I don't mean one meter as the total of your human uh, body's DNA, but within each cell, there's a meter of DNA. So we have this, this um, physical puzzle of how does the cell get a meter of DNA into itself? And it becomes even more interesting a puzzle when one realizes that DNA, as molecules go, is actually very stiff. So if you just take a meter of DNA and um, you know imagine just uh, having it free in a liquid, it will actually undergo this sort of random walk that I've illustrated here. And um, even the size of that random walk is hundreds of microns, much bigger than the size of a cell. I've indicated both of those, I'm sorry, um, to scale in this drawing. So here's our DNA, um, here's a cell to scale. So already we can kind of tell that there is um, this very, uh, interesting physical tasks that the cell must be doing to package its DNA, which I'm actually not going to talk about, but you can feel free to ask me about, that isn't just letting it be a free random walk, but actually wrapping it very tightly around particular proteins. So that's DNA. We can think about things like proteins as well. So every single protein is a long chain-like molecule, as, as I'm sure uh, all of you know. And that chain-like molecule folds itself into a particular shape. It's not some external apparatus that makes it have, it, uh, have some particular shape, but the physical interactions among the components um, bend and twist the protein into some very particular sculpted form. Uh, cells also do very, very dramatic physical things. If this works, I will show you a movie. Uh, can you see this movie? Hopefully you can. Uh, what you're looking at here is an immune cell in a, a polymer matrix. This one is not inside a, a body, but is just uh, in vitro. But you can see it deforming and stretching and moving um, as, it undergo as it goes about its surveillance uh, that's part of every uh, immune cell's function. So all of these things, oh, actually, uh, I thought I'd show one, one movie. This I'll come back to later on, but this is from my own lab. Um, these are immune cells in green in a live larval zebrafish. And they're surrounding the gut. Uh, and in the gut, there are bacteria, which are in magenta here. So uh, these immune cells you know, scan the, the environment, uh, detect things like bacteria and so on. So all of these sorts of things, um, you know, really highlight that basically everything in biology is physical. And the flip side of that is that physics or thinking about physics can help us make sense of all sorts of things. In fact, I would say everything in biology. That's not to say that everything in biology um, is just a physics problem. There's many things that are beyond physics like evolutionary biology and chemical signaling and so on. But physics can help us make sense of all of these very different biological phenomena. That's something I also try to convey a lot um, to, for example, undergraduates, uh, that you know, physics is this really quite a, kind of remarkable tool for understanding you know, why living things are the way they are. So I, I think about a variety of aspects of this. And in fact, this broad thing of just communicating that this allows us to make sense of all kinds of things about the living world, uh, in fact, even spurred me to write a uh, popular science or general audience book about this uh, called So Simple a Beginning, uh, and this was, it took me many years to write and I'm rather happy with how it turned out. And uh, uh, this was published just last year uh, by Princeton, Princeton University Press. I can come back to saying a bit more, actually I will say a little bit more about that later on. So uh, let me, sorry, click the wrong button. Come back here. Um, right, so uh, let me 
now launch into something more specific about biophysics, which is what most of my lab's activity in looking at this intersection between physics and biology um, involves. So I should be able to come back here. Good. And that has to do with the biophysics of the gut microbiome. So um, this, like I said, is, is the main activity of most of my research group. Here's a photo of us from last summer. Uh, it's a mix of uh, some graduate students, some sort of PhD students, um, two of whom at the moment are, at the time of this photo, it was three physics, one biology PhD students, uh, some undergraduates. Um, yeah, all of us were working together on, on these sorts of things. So um, what do I mean when I mention gut microbes? Well, these days, as, as um, you probably know, uh, it's quite well known that each of us is actually more than just a human. So our bodies are composed of one human with human mm -hmm. cells and lots and lots of bacteria. In fact, we have as many bacterial cells in our body as human cells uh, with many different species, lots of variation. And these microbes mostly live in the gut, the digestive tract, and they actually do quite a lot of things. They play roles in digestion, uh, which you know, is not surprising, but more surprisingly, they're involved in things like training the immune system, uh, so immune function in general. They're involved in things like the early development of, of various organs, and also a, a remarkable array of diseases, um, including especially complex diseases like diabetes and even things like various neurological disorders are known to have um, correlations and in some cases even causal linkages between particular um, gut microbial compositions. So there's been this enormous amount of interest in gut bacterial communities. And we know a great deal about the compositions of these communities and how they differ in normal and, and diseased people and so on. But there's still a lot of very fundamental questions that are poorly understood. And these include especially things like what determines these compositions and how can we alter them? especially changing what species are present or their abundances and so on. So these, it turns out, are very difficult questions to answer. And um, that's led us to ask, okay, can a physical perspective, um, as it does for things like DNA packaging or protein folding and so on, can a physical perspective help us make sense of all of this? So um, I put up this little illustration here of just a, a rocky shore and, um, I put it here because if you were to go to any kind of rocky shore, you would see um, all kinds of, of uh, animals living there and these tidal systems, starfish and uh, lichen, and, or sorry, not lichen, uh, starfish and mussels and sea lions and all these sorts of things. And um, if somebody told you that they were going to try to understand this whole ecosystem, despite being completely ignorant of the fact that um, you know, starfish can move around and mussels stay fixed, that the tide comes in and out twice a day, that the topography is rocky with like pools and so on, all they were going to do is just take DNA, take swabs, swab the rocks and, and uh, sequence the DNA they found. You would say that, that that is complete nonsense. There is no way to understand this ecosystem without understanding its physical environment. So that seems almost obvious, but it turns out that that approach of just you know, taking DNA samples is actually how we currently get almost all of our knowledge of the gut microbiome um, by typically taking like fecal samples and doing like DNA sequencing. So this is in fact extremely powerful. Um, as I've mentioned, all these things we've learned, especially about correlations with disease come from this sort of DNA or RNA based analysis, but kind of obviously it has almost no temporal resolution. And it tells us all, well, basically nothing about the physical structure of these gut microbial communities. So we thought to ourselves, oh yeah, okay. So very, we, it turns out that we know very little about the structure and dynamics of these gut microbial communities. We don't know if like spatial niches exist that allow uh, coexistence or that influence competition. We don't know about fluctuations and timescales of, of fluctuations and responses. We don't know how to think about like nucleation and growth of bacterial colonies. Um, so can we do something about this? Can we answer these sorts of questions? Well, what we thought many years ago is, okay, let's go about this um, by coming up with a good model system and looking at it, imaging it. So for our model system, we make use of zebrafish. 
And uh, these are actually very popular throughout the life sciences as a model uh, system for a variety of reasons. They're vertebrates, so they have a lot of physiological similarities with humans and other vertebrates. They are at young ages quite transparent. So I'm showing here a larval zebrafish. Uh, so it's about six days old. Um, we put a red dye into the gut just so you can see where the gut is. Um, so you can look at them. And they're genetically tractable. So there are various uh, transgenics with, for example, things like fluorescent immune cells. Um, so they're a great model system for those reasons. Plus, it turns out that one can prepare notobiotic zebrafish, prepare, sorry, prepare zebrafish to be initially germ-free. That is devoid of any gut microbes. That allows you to then add in particular species or combinations of species, allowing you to do controlled experiments. And these so-called notobiotic techniques were especially developed by um, our collaborator, also at the University of Oregon, Karen Dillman. It's also I, I, I should definitely point out for this audience, zebrafish um, are, are of course native to uh, South Asia, so India and Bangladesh, especially. Um, and uh, yeah, you can find them uh, in all kinds of, um, not just uh, waterways, but things like rice fields and, and so on. So uh, I mentioned that these are transparent, but it's still rather challenging to image them. And um, this actually, again, points to a kind of intersection between physics and biology of developing physical tools, uh, whether they're microscopy tools or in the case of our host, like infrared imaging tools and all kinds of things like that. So, um, imaging is challenging actually because we want to image a, a three-dimensional volume that's fairly large on the scale of bacteria and we need to do that three-dimensional imaging quite quickly because every minute or so the gut is undergoing these peristaltic contractions which your guts are doing as well this, this uh, churning motion that drives uh, the contents down so we need to be able to do fast three-dimensional imaging and the technique we use to do this is one that was developed, especially uh, by various groups uh, in Europe in the early 2000s, uh, called light sheet fluorescence microscopy. And the idea is that one is looking at fluorescence. Um, so one engineers one's bacteria, for example, to have fluorescent proteins, but one shapes the fluorescence excitation into a thin sheet. And then with a perpendicular lens, you detect what is emitted by uh, in that excited plane. So at any instant, you get a two-dimensional slice of the sample, and you can scan that back and forth to get a three-dimensional uh, image very rapidly. So we've built now a couple of these light sheet setups. Here's a photograph of one. At the end of each of these glass capillaries, held in an agar gel is a larval zebrafish. So they're not free swimming, but they're alive and uh, yeah, held in a weak gel, so you can image them there. Here, you can see the larval zebrafish uh, sitting over there. So that's the setup. What do we see? Well, um, I'll show you a couple of examples. Here, we're just looking at one plane over time. So we're not scanning uh, to get a 3D image, but we're just looking at one plane in time. And this was a, is a fish that just has one species of bacteria in, in it. And this we're looking at its gut. This species exists almost completely as very motile individuals. Each of these little specks that you're seeing is a bacterium, and it's just zooming around uh, in the gut. Very fast, very active. Um, other species, and in fact, most species that we look at are uh, not as motile. So they do have motile individuals, but most of the population exists in dense, three-dimensional clusters. And here, this movie is a scan through the depth of the gut. So we're looking at the, the, the whole volume of the gut uh, as we scan that sheet through it. So there are a variety of these bacterial behaviors and uh, one can look at that for different species. Um, I won't go into that in detail, except uh, just very, I'll instead tell you some specific things we've learned by looking at these behaviors. So um, it turns out that almost everything we look at, um, these physical processes, these aggregation or motility or so on behaviors, end up actually being extremely important to uh, understanding what the uh, gut communities are doing. So I'll show you one example first that has to do with color. Um, and this especially was the work of a former graduate student, Savannah Logan. So 
cholera, as um, I'm sure that sure you all know, is uh, a disease that's caused by bacterium Vibrio cholera. And um, it still causes uh, around 100,000 deaths per year, largely due to poor sanitation. And it's been studied intensely for uh, over a century. There are still actually some kind of surprising questions that are still un unanswered about it, which is how is it so good at invading the gut? So when cholera colonizes a human, for example, it's not finding a empty germ-free human, but one with trillions of microbes in it. So how does it invade so successfully? So it turns out that Vibrio cholera, like many bacteria, has a something called a type six secretion system. And th this allows it to puncture adjacent cells and insert toxins. So we wondered, okay, what's this type six secretion system doing in an actual gut? And this was work um, also in collaboration with, um, especially Brian Hammer, who's a microbiologist at Georgia Tech. So Brian engineered strains that um, basically are always expressing this type six secretion system. So they're always stabbing and ones that cannot stab at all. And uh, there's others as well that I won't go into. And so we did an experiment in which we first colonized larval zebrafish with one other species. That's gonna be indicated in pink here, it's this Aramona species, and it tends to form large aggregates. So we colonize with this native aggregating species, and then um, we introduce the uh, Vibrio cholera to the, just to the water. So what I'm showing you here is the Aramonas, the native one. Good. We're scanning through the gut after it's been potentially invaded by the non-stabbing Vibrio cholera. And what we see is there's plenty of this Aramonas there. It's abundant, we have large aggregates, it's exactly as we would expect. Here, however, is the native one after we add the uh, type six active, the stabbing Vibrio cholera. And we look and the gut is almost completely empty. Let's see if I can pause this. It's a bit hard to pause. I'll just, so we have this big empty space there's a couple of bacteria like that just show up as little specks right there. Um, the native bacteria is almost completely wiped out. So uh, quantifying this, the abundance of the native bacteria is over a hundredfold lower when the Vibrio cholera is able to stab. Here we can, I'm showing you this in time. Oh. See, can I do this? Oh, I'll skip the time. Um, actually, no, I won't. let's see if I can do Oh, there we go. So here's the native one. This is over the course of about 12 hours after being invaded by the non-stabbing Vibrio cholera. And there's lots of dynamics going on that I'll come back to later, but it's still, the native one is nicely present. Invaded by the stabbing Vibrio cholera, it's wiped out. So we can quantify all of this and analyze these um, population drops, which actually let me skip over that one. Uh, enormous drops in population. And so clearly the Vibrio cholera uh, type six secretion system is doing something dramatic. So what is it doing? Well, our initial thought and what most people in the field actually would have thought um, uh, seeing this data is that, well, the type six secretion system can stab bacteria, including a bacterial competitor like the Saramonas, so it's killing it. But we decided to keep looking at this and we noticed something really quite remarkable. So here I'm showing you not the bacteria, but the gut itself, which we're imaging using something called differential interference contrast microscopy. And up at the top is a fish colonized with this um, non-stabbing Vibrio cholera. And it looks, um, well, anyway, and the, at the bottom is the gut is the gut of a fish colonized with the stabbing Vibrio cholera. And even by eye, it's clear that the contractions in this case are much stronger. And we can do things like image full symmetry to quantify this. And what we find is that the amplitude of these gut contractions is about 100% stronger in uh, fish that are colonized by this type six positive, the stabbing Vibrio cholera. So the Vibrio cholera then, it, oh, let me skip over that one. Sorry. Huh. Sorry, messed up that slide. 
Anyway, I'll just state this while I come back to that, that one. Um, so what the Vibrio cholera is doing is stabbing the, um, uh, the host, in fact, and inducing very strong contractions of the gut. In fact, we can knock out its ability to uh, interact with the host and that uh, enhanced gut motility goes away. So Vibrio cholera, in other words, is using this type six secretion system to increase the strength of this mechanical transport in the gut. And that's allowing it to displace resident microbes and then uh, occupy better itself. So one of the things we're currently doing is figuring out which zebrafish cells is Vibrio perturbing with the type six secretion system. So this is ongoing, but we suspect for various reasons that it is in fact macrophages, which are these immune cells uh, that are in fact the ones that I showed back at the beginning that are kind of surrounding and patrolling the gut. This one should be a movie, there we go. So um, we've been engineering different Vibrio, including uh, zebrafish native Vibrio cholera, or uh, Vibrio species, to alter this type six secretion system activity. And we're watching things like the recruitment of these macrophages, uh, their death, and so on. So here is one a, a, sort of another example where the physical activity of both the bacteria in terms of what they're doing, uh, whether they're aggregating or stabbing things and so on, and the physical properties of the whole environment, its mechanical contractions, transport, and so on, end up being really key to describing a very dramatic physical or very dramatic um, biological phenomenon. So I'll give you another example, and I'll uh, again try to be brief to, to give time to, to, to chat. Um, but here's an example that has to do with antibiotics. And, um, and I'll show you some recent stuff with this one as well. So it's known that taking antibiotics can induce quite large changes to the composition of the gut microbiome. That's known for, right? Yeah. But what is kind of surprising is that even quite low concentrations of antibiotics, which are actually often found as like environmental contaminants, can have a large impact on the gut microbiome. Um, but how this happens is actually not well understood. And here again, it's one of these situations where knowing that this happens is an outcome of doing like DNA sequencing and so on. But the mechanism, understanding why it happens, is harder to figure out. So we thought, okay, let's, let's see, again, in the literal sense of looking at antibiotics and gut microbes in zebrafish. So we picked a commonly used anti antibiotic, and we looked at two particular species of bacteria. Uh, the first that I'll tell you about is actually this um, uh, very motile Vibrio species that I showed back at the beginning. So if you add a weak amount of antibiotics, so about a 10th of the so-called minimum inhibitory concentration, a weak amount of antibiotics to uh, zebrafish that have been colonized with this Vibrio species, you get, oh, sorry, you get a roughly hundredfold drop in the bacterial abundance. Okay. Um, and that you can just figure out from uh, just plating the guts and dissecting them and so on. So why is that happening? Well, looking at the bacteria, we see something quite remarkable that uh, this species, which is normally extremely fast and motile, instead becomes very slow and uh, quite elongated. It's a bit hard to see here, but slow and elongated. And the consequence of this, if one looks over a larger period, like several, hour, several hours, is that these slow, slow and elongated bacteria are not able to withstand the transport, this peristaltic contractile transport of the gut, and end up being uh, expelled from the gut. And we can actually test the bacteria are actually alive. They're not being killed by the antibiotic, but the change in their physical properties is causing them to be expelled. So that filamentation is actually a known property of bacteria from in vitro, just petri dish measurements. Here I'm showing the same species without and with antibiotics, and you see this kind of filamentation and so on there. And what's happening is that in the gut, these antibiotic effects are amplified due to this coupling of aggregation and transport. So that was uh, what happens to a very motile species. What happens if the species is already aggregated? Now here, our thought was that, well, they're already aggregated, so it's not gonna matter if the antibiotics cause further aggregation, but it turned out that that was not the case. In fact, 
when this enterobacter species, which is a very aggregated one, is exposed to weak antibiotics, the concentration of, bac of bacteria in the gut drops even more by a factor of a thousand. And watching this, what appears to be the case is that normally there are both large clusters and small clusters. With antibiotics, the small clusters are dramatically suppressed and we only have large clusters then. So why does this matter? Well, what we realized is that without, um, so aggregating species have a real challenge that these aggregates are always you know, transported down the gut by the peristaltic contractions. So how can an aggregating species persist? Well, it must always be nucleating and growing new aggregates. So if that nucleation and growth of new aggregates is suppressed, then uh, the population can't maintain itself. So we've spent a while developing and also testing a more a quantitative model of that kind of aggregation and growth process. But I think what I'm going to do, and I'll just briefly point out that that can do things like um, explain the distribution of cluster size, uh, the, the distribution of the sizes of these aggregates. So how many cells are in an aggregate um, for different sorts of species. And this comes about from thinking about the processes that underlie the formation and destruction of aggregates, things like growth, fragmentation, and so on. But um, you can feel free to ask me about that, but I think I will skip forward in the interests of having time for a discussion and questions and so on. And um, just point out for the gut microbiome aspects of our work, the, I think take home messages, the things to kind of keep in mind are that things like imaging are extremely powerful for looking at the uh, population dynamics of gut microbial communities in an actual live gut. Um, and these populations are spatially heterogeneous and dynamic, and they're influenced by the physical environment of the gut. That um, things like aggregation and the motility of the gut can drive expulsion, antibiotics can alter that. So they're influenced by the physical environment of the gut, and they also influence it themselves through things like the types of excretion system. So biophysics is not often thought about in the context of the gut microbiome, but um, this, this principle of physical uh, phenomena or physical rules being important to all kinds of, of uh, living phenomena uh, manifests itself uh, very much here. So now stepping back again to the sort of more uh, broad big picture things, uh, as I've mentioned, uh, my perspective is very much that um, everything in biology has some sort of physical component driving it. So whether it's something as basic as just having to obey the laws of physics or more interesting things having to do with the ways in which those laws are obeyed or the properties of bio biological materials and so on. So are there general themes that um, kind of help us think about this whole broad topic? So that's something I actually thought a lot about, especially in writing. Um, my pop science book and in teaching my courses, especially for non, for a very general kind of audience. Um, are, there, are there general themes? And um, what I came up with is, first of all, yes, the answer, uh, yes, I think there are themes. And um, I'll just kind of briefly put up here what I think some of these themes are, because you might, I think are, are potentially interesting to think about in the context of uh, whatever you all might be working on. So one, is the notion of self-assembly. And that is that the uh, instructions for putting together components are encoded in those components themselves. So this is not just a biological theme. We have self-assembly and all kinds of things in the, the non-living world as well, whether it's you know, the angle that a sand pile takes or um, you know, the crystals of a, of a snowflake, but it is really everywhere in living systems. I mentioned before things like the um, folding of proteins, where the shape a protein folds into is encoded in the uh, things like electric charge of the amino acids and so on in the, in the protein itself. So self-assembly is this very um, kind of ubiquitous theme. It also takes place uh, at larger scales, things like organ assemblies of cells, um, and even in things like community microbial or other ecological communities where different interactions seem to give rise to robust structures. 
So a second theme is that um, nature makes use of what I like to call regulatory circuitry, things that use feedback or other kinds of um, uh, mechanisms to have essentially the outputs uh, influence the inputs. And um, we see this all the time. Uh, we see one of the most kind of dramatic examples is simply the fact that um, the human genome, like all other genomes, has remarkably few genes. So as you probably know, the human genome has about 20,000 genes. There are about 20,000 different proteins, roughly speaking, uh, that are encoded in your DNA. And that's a remarkably small number given the complexity of you and uh, other animals and the kinds of things you do. How do 20,000 genes do so much? Well, the answer is that we're not always expressing the same set of those 20,000. We can do different combinations of things. Uh, your immune cells are expressing different genes than your neurons and so on. And we can do that by making use of circuitry that, that influences things like gene expression based on what signals are being detected from other cells on the outside or so on. So you can generate complexity through the circuitry. And I drew this, some of you may recognize these kind of circuit diagrams. Um, I drew it this way because these are actually very analogous to kind of logical circuits in other systems and they make use of similar kinds of physical principles. The third one is this notion of not just randomness, but predictable randomness. That um, a lot of things in living systems are random. Probably the most, uh, ubiquitous example is just Brownian motion. So molecules are just diffusing around and um, you can't exactly predict, predict their trajectories and so on. But they have properties like their mean position, their kind of the, 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 the width of this cloudy curve, things like that, that are for statistical reasons quite predictable. And so life actually makes use of this quite often. When you release neurotransmitters at like a synapse, um, those neurotransmitters just diffuse, acro diffuse across that cleft. There's nothing taking them from one side to another. But the kind of average properties of that diffusion are well, well, you know, well defined enough that your neuron can rely on that to take, on average, neurotransmitters across that cleft in some particular amount of time. And finally, the last theme, um, which really applies especially to like macroscopic things, is a notion of scaling that different physical laws are kind of differently important at different uh, scales. So things like surface tension and uh, things like surface tension and uh, gravity and things like that affect organisms differently depending on, on their size. And that makes the strategies that different organisms adopt um, size dependent. So small insects, for example, can walk on water while you and I can't. Uh, not because they have some particular chemistry of uh, interacting with the water surface or something like that, but rather because the way surface tension and gravity scale makes that much easier the smaller you are. Um, so just to give like you know a little example of, of, of one of those, and like I said, I'm happy to talk more about this um, uh, as, as you like. So if you ever play around with soap bubbles, just you know regular soap dish bubbles or uh, regular soap bubbles and you make a junction of four soap bubbles together you will find that they uh, make a junction that's like this as i'm drawing on the screen here and it turns out that that's because of uh, principles of minimizing surface area due to surface tension and so on if you look in the eye of a fly they have particular photoreceptor cells. If you look at those cells indicated in orange here, those adopt exactly the same arrangement. And um, moreover, if you make mutant flies that have three of these photoreceptor cells, they adopt the arrangement that three soap bubbles do, and five adopt the arrangement that five do, and so on. So in this and many other examples, it looks like the fly is not encoding some exact instruction for here's where you put this cell, here's where you put this cell, here's where you put this cell, but rather encoding just the instructions to make the cells and letting these physical interactions having to do with surfaces and forces and so on uh, do the rest of the work. So um, yeah, I'll open it up to questions in a moment, and uh, but I first must make sure to acknowledge my group, which is uh, great to work with. 
um, especially uh, in recent things, especially Julia, who's working on these type six secretion system things, um, and several past students, um, Deepika, Savannah, Brandon, especially, you've done a lot of the things that I was telling you about earlier. So with that, I will, I will stop for now and uh, yes, and open things up. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Professor Raghu. It's a beautiful or insightful talk, and especially your work on animal associated microbial community. Thank you. And there is one question. So I think uh, most of the students are from undergraduates and they will take some time to understand your lectures actually. Because most of the uh, students from the general background of physics, or biophysics backgrounds, uh, there is one question. Uh, 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 what microbes have any influence in the pH level of our digestive system? Ah, so that's, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So um, the answer is, uh, so it will be a unsatisfying answer because the answer is yes, but that's poorly understood. <laughs> um, so it is known, so there's kind of an interaction both ways regarding pH. So different species, different bacterial species will, um, uh, you know, uh, grow differently at different pH. And this is true in humans, but also true in zebrafish and so on. Uh, this very motile Vibrio species I was showing prefers lower pH, other species prefer other pH, and so on. So the microbes themselves can sense the local pH, um, but then they themselves can also, um, especially by secreting various uh, bile acids and things like that, alter the pH. So how all of these lead to a sort of equilibrium is not well understood, but certainly there's influence both ways of the, um, of the kind of animal-induced pH affecting the bacteria and the bacteria affecting the host pH. So that's actually something, yeah, that's uh, um, the topic of investigation, yes. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Raghu. And this is the one question from my side, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, I want to take, uh, have you assessed the H. pylori some, somewhere? Oh, yes. Um, so if, for those who don't know, uh, H. pylori is the bacterium which is responsible for stomach ulcers. So it's a, uh, it's a fascinating bacteria. Um, it's also a quite mysterious one because it is one um, that's actually quite common. Many, many people have it, and only a very small fraction of those develop stomach ulcers. Um, it is one that very much does sense pH, and in fact navigates to, um, it actually prefers quite acidic environments of, uh, for example, the stomach. So my lab, we actually have looked at H. pylori, not in the zebrafish gut, but just doing in vitro experiments. This was many years ago, in fact, um, looking at its chemotaxis, its ability to, to you know, migrate towards um, regions of different uh, different chemical composition. Yeah. So but we have not looked at it inside the gut. Yeah. Here you, in the, your study, you have uh, taken the uh, sample from the animal kingdom, that, like a zebra face. Uh, have you ever the, assessed all these things in the human body? That is an excellent question. Um, no, the short answer is no. Uh, what we hope is that a lot of the things we've been looking at kind of inspire people to um, do particular experiments related to humans. Our approach, because it is so much focused on microscopy and kind of visual um, examination of what's going on, you really can't do in humans. There's no good way to, to image um, yeah, in humans or even in mice and so on. So the zebrafish are really quite uh, unique and useful in terms of being quite transparent. But to be more concrete, as an example of something that I do think can be translated from our work uh, to human work, I briefly mentioned that we have been looking at things like the distribution of different bacterial aggregate sizes. So uh, I only very quickly showed this, but um, let me put it up again, in fact. 
So here for several, oh, hold on. Good. Several different species. This is basically like how many clusters are there with a given number of bacteria. So you have lots of small clusters, fewer, uh, fewer medium-sized clusters, um, still fewer large clusters, and so on. And it turns out this has a particular form that is um, that tells you something about growth rates and, and things like that. We determine these by doing this like live imaging in zebrafish. But now that we've established that that works, what we've actually suggested to people is that this might be possible to do in things like human fecal samples, looking at bacterial aggregate sizes in those. And now that we know that this is that this tells you something about the underlying processes, inferring from, for example, the colonies and human fecal samples, what the underlying unobservable processes in the human gut might be. So we, ho we hope to inspire human studies, but we're not doing them ourselves. Yes, uh, I think uh, human studies and, uh, uh, you know, you have taken the marine species in, the, in, the, in your uh, case studies. And yes. I think the, we, we, we have to extend that things to the human existence, you know, uh, as, uh, that will be very helpful in the medical sciences and improvement their diagnosis process. Exactly. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, another question is very general question, but uh, it's, uh, it's come from the ignited minds of our uh, students. Uh, that is the what has been the contribution of biophysics in fighting COVID. It's a general question. Oh, uh, that's a wonderful. Yeah, that's I, I that's I thank you very much. I, that's it. That is a wonderful question. Um, so I think the biggest contribution is, in fact, in the development of mRNA vaccines, uh, which are you know the, the vaccines that have proven um, so effective and so like quick to, to, to mass produce. And um, I'm very glad you asked this because I think this is not often thought about in the context of biophysics. But really, the way that these work is by encapsulating See, I might even have a picture of this somewhere, encapsulating, um, let's see, RNA. Uh, hold on one second, let's see if I can find this. Well, that's okay. Anyway, um, so as, as you probably know, RNA, uh, it's, the thing that DNA is, is uh, transcribed into that then codes for creating proteins. These mRNA vaccines are basically um, capsules of this uh, RNA and lipids. And I mentioned this principle of like self-assembly that ends up being vital to that formation of this unit as a whole. So RNA has a very strong negative charge. And what's done to have this lipid encapsulation is using like positively charged lipids. So for many years, in fact, um, these RNA vaccines actually make use of decades of kind of biophysical investigation of things like DNA lipid and like RNA lipid uh, interactions. So people figured out um, this sort of basic knowledge of, yes, you can make these structures and how do you encapsulate RNA lipids and so on. And then it becomes even more interesting because if you have an overly stable structure, you will encapsulate the RNA, but you'll never get it out, and then it's useless as a vaccine. So these actually make use of uh, things like lipids with um, kind of quite pH sensitive charge groups that then change their charge when they're taken up by cells, then destabilizing this self assembled unit and allowing the release of RNA. So there was actually a lot of kind of fundamental biophysical work, especially on things like electrical charge interactions among things like lipids and uh, RNA that made these vaccines possible. Um, so that I think is the, uh, the biggest contribution of biophysics to fighting COVID. The second thing I would say is that, um, you know, there's been lots and lots of kind of uh, epidemiological modeling for COVID. And I'm not an expert on that, so I'm not going to, to comment uh, much. 
And I think a lot of it has been not very good and a lot of it has been quite good. A lot of the things that have been quite good, um, in fact, especially like Gautam Menon in India is I think one of the really good people on this are from kind of a physical perspective. He's a biophysicist um, and really kind of making use of the modeling insights that have come from biophysics in general and applying them to things like COVID. Um, yeah, excellent question. And I'm also glad you asked this because going back to the vaccines, you know, nobody who is working on these lipid RNA things, you know, 20 years ago, even 10 years ago, would have known that this would be so useful. But it's a good illustration that doing kind of basic biophysics research can actually can really pay off. Thank you. And I think one last question from my own curiosity that uh, Professor Raghu, uh, can you have a give insight on the how the quantum mechanics, uh, you know, contributing such kind of uh, work which you are working? Oh yeah, so that's a good question. You know, I, to be perfectly honest, I think, um, what, especially when I talk to like undergraduates who are asking, you know, what areas of physics are most useful. I don't put quantum mechanics too high on the list. You can get very far uh, with classical classical mechanics, especially statistical mechanics is really the most important thing for biophysics. Um, yeah, statistical mechanics and, and uh, thermodynamics and so on. Quantum mechanics does uh, come into things. The most important place are in things like photosynthesis which really makes use of kind of interesting energy level transfers and so on. And I mean, as, as, as you know, for plants, of course, this is really you know, uh, crucial. So photosynthesis is something you can't really understand without quantum mechanics. The other place actually quantum mechanics comes in is actually in a lot of the development of these tools, uh, like microscopy tools and so on. Some of these, especially some of these um, kind of interesting, uh, super resolution techniques, uh, you may have heard of stimulated emission depletion microscopy and so on, make use of like quantum effects to change like fluorescence properties of objects and allow you to do imaging in very interesting ways. So the quantum mm -hmm. side of, of, um, uh, of imaging has been a useful one. For kind of most biophysics or most kind of biological processes in general, you can kind of take the existence of molecules and so on as a given, and then you don't really have to care too much about quantum mechanics. And also, yeah, and also working uh, exercise of the biological motors. That's true, yes, yes, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, all of the questions you have already covered in your presentation. Oh, okay. And now, mm -hmm. I'm, now I'm in the position to re especially recommend your book, you know? <laughs> I just go and uh, dear uh, audience, uh, this is the book uh, uh, written by the Professor Raghu. And really, it's a fantastic book. And uh, I strongly recommend this book for the budding biophysicists uh, which want to appeal their imagination towards the how physical laws exercising over the biological phenomenon. Definitely, you have to go through this book. It's a wonderful <laughs> book. Well, thank you very much. And uh, yeah. I if, so, if anybody you know, uh, checks it out yeah. from the library and has questions, please uh, please don't hesitate to email me. I, I am happy to answer questions. And most of the things that uh, anyone uh, can appeal their imagination to by the work of which Partha Sarthi have done on this, the illustration of the DNA, proteins, and other uh, communities on that particular books. The wonderful yeah. drawing you have made there. Oh, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I like drawing. So we are in the position. We are in the position to wrap up this session. And before summing, uh, so wrapping it, uh, I, I had an opportunity and a privilege to what of thanks to uh, Professor Agbir Parthasarthi, and thank you, sir, uh, for accepting my invitation in a single call. And it shows you are a strong commitment for the science communication, especially. And as a scientist, as a faculty member at Oregon University, you are doing all the, uh, all. And really, it's an insightful talk of our students. And definitely, we'll be in touch if uh, we'll have some uh, insight from you. So, Wonderful. Well, thank, well, thank you very much. much. I had a very good uh, insight with us and uh, devoting our time with our audience. Thank you. I, I enjoyed it, and the questions were very nice. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. I had a very good time. Th and and I, uh, thank you for the invitation. And officially, we uh, we are in the position to invite you uh, at offline somewhere when you visit this uh, when you visit your country. 
mm-hmm. then definitely we will we would love to welcome you in this our campus wonderful thank Great. you and dear audience thank you all audience for being with us and definitely we are signing off until we meet again thank you very much thank you